Hello property entrepreneurs. Uh, we're at the Baker Street Property Meet and tonight is all about how to scale your property business. We've got a whole bunch of talks from three fantastic speakers and they're all on this YouTube channel. Uh, so subscribe, hit the bell icon and uh, you'll be notified as soon as we upload new videos which are all designed to help you become a more successful property entrepreneur. Uh, we're at the Baker Street Property Meet with 150 property entrepreneurs. Are we happy to be here guys? Next speaker is Rod Turner. Now we're tackling this subject of scaling your property business from all sorts of different angles. What Rod is going to share with you really is how to scale your property business but keep both feet on the ground, do it sustainably, do it um, uh, with uh, full understanding of the risks that you're undertaking and mitigating them and, and managing them along the way. Because it's all very well scaling your property business, but you can scale and burn. You really want to be here in a few years' time to tell the tale. That's what Rod's going to share. Uh, so please give a very warm Baker Street welcome to Rod Turner. Thanks, everyone. Um, I've been told I've only got 15 minutes, so I am going to whiz through some of these slides. Uh, first one is a bit about my experience, so we'll do this very quickly. First small development I bought was in 2007. Worst time ever to buy a development. Um, made lots of mistakes and naively, luckily, fortunately, grew that capital through tax efficient home moving, flips, assisted sales, and general trading. Uh, started doing some house to flat conversions, commercial to resi, commercial restructuring, which I might touch on a bit. Um, developing in different areas, so 2015 decided London was a dodgy market to be in, and so started investing more in Manchester. Um, remote investing, so I've got a bit of a portfolio up there as well, as in London. Uh, new build modular schemes, uh, which are really interesting, and portfolio building. So the basis of what I want to kind of go through with you is all investments are based on three things really. It's the reward and how does that balance with the risk that goes with that reward and the effort you put in. And lots of people often forget about that effort but it's really, really important. See, so when you're looking at an investment opportunity, whether it's a development or just a buy to let or an HMO, how much of your worth can you afford to risk? Okay, so what are you affording to risk? And on a development, that might be what your PG is for, a personal guarantee. So sometimes it's 20% of the debt that you're taking on. <coughs> sometimes, on a buy to that, your personal liability is actually for the entire amount of debt. So it's understanding what circumstances you might have to front that money. Okay? How much time and energy can you afford or want to give up? Okay? A young 20-year-old single man might have a lot more energy to go and buy buy to let in Newcastle than someone who's reaching retirement age with a nest egg and some dependable kids. Okay, so again, something to think about there. And is the chance of that reward worth that lost time and effort and or the proportion of your wealth that you're risking? Because let's face it, we're all in property to have a better life for ourselves. Okay, but we don't want to be creating a job that we're stuck in and we don't enjoy. So one of the things you want to look at is your personal situation. One of the great things about property is there's plenty of ways to skin a cat. What's right for me might not be right for you, and it might not be right for me in five years' time. So it's understanding your personal situation. Okay? Like I said, are you young, free and single, with no kids, but also you might have no capital. Okay? So to get that particular reward, you might want to be looking at higher risk or and higher effort levels in order to get that reward. Whereas you might find someone who's ready to retire with a pension pot of 300 grand to invest, but if their investment's lost, do they have the energy to go and get a job, or the want to go and get a job to get that? So there you can see their effort and, lift and risk levels will be very different on the reward, but someone's got the capital, someone doesn't. So it's very dependent on your personal situation. 
it's so important in property to understand what your product is. What's your value proposition to your customer, client, lender? Okay? And what market is it in? The UK, we talk about the UK property market all the time, but London's very different to Manchester at the moment. Manchester's booming. London's terrible. Yeah? So it's understanding what it is. Um, Aberdeen property. Yeah? Who, anyone here own a property in Aberdeen? Right? Thank God, because that was decimated by oil issues. Okay? And it's very dependent on the oil industry. All right? Things like that, understanding your market. So different locations are different markets. Different products are different markets. And what are the risks currently to your specific product in your market? What are the factors that affect your market? So some of the factors, the main factors we talk about when we're discussing the property market are credit, supply and demand, and sentiment. And I put that in the order because that's what I feel the most important, really. Credit, supply and demand, we're on an island. With planning regulations as they are, you can argue there's never ever going to be enough houses. But actually, it's the spread of where those houses are geographically located as well. And then sentiment. So often, when you've got the fundamentals that we'll go through in a minute, where you're looking at how the market cycle is, sentiment will push it over the edge at the top and pull it down in the trough at the bottom. Okay? So it's important to understand those. So for example, if you were to take credit as a factor that you're looking at for your market, you might say, well, what are the factors that influence credit? That could be inflation, government intervention, such as uh, rental stress tests. It could be wage growth, a huge one, and government spending. So where's the government putting that money into infrastructure that's going to create more jobs? So like Vanish said at the beginning, someone's affordability is key. Where's someone's wages going to grow so that they can afford to spend more money on their rent or buying property? And not just one person, we want that whole population of that target market to start increasing. What could the future risks or opportunities be based on that? An example here, you might not be able to see it, it's not, not particularly clear, but this is right moves, okay, asking price data. Now everyone will moan at me and go, yeah, but it's asking price, it's not sold prices. That's absolutely true. The problem with sold prices is they're not current, okay? The time it takes to get onto the land reg, or for your solicitor to even register it, and then the land reg to have it up on the system is quite considerable. So actually looking at asking price data gives an idea of what the sentiment is as well. So it's understanding not just as the UK, but all these regional areas, and then looking into why that is. Here, very similar to what uh, Vanish was talking about earlier with rental prices. When we talk about housing affordability, a lot of the time we talk about um, house prices in relation to people's salaries. But that's irrelevant unless everyone's buying cash. How we buy houses is very different to how we bought houses 20, 30 years ago. We use a lot more debt. Okay? So what's interesting to look at is the upfront cost in relation to your annual salary, but also your uh, monthly servicing costs in relation to your monthly salary. So that's your mortgage costs. And what's interesting is since mortgage records began, every property crash we've had has been preceded by people's monthly um, mortgage costs as a percentage of their salary going above 60%. So what are some of the things that can influence that? What are some of the things can, that can influence your mortgage monthly servicing costs? Because I'm under time pressure, I'll shout them out. So we've got things like interest rates. Absolutely, interest rates are a huge one. Another big thing that's happened in the last 20, 30 years is mortgage terms have increased. First time buyers can get 40 year terms. That's going to spread the cost out. Okay, uh, so some of those are really important factors to look at. So some other examples of factors that affect the market. So things like stamp duty affecting four bed houses and higher valley houses in London was huge. Yeah, April, 15, April 2015 that came in. That has really put a kill on the top of the market coming down. How has the oil industry affected properties in Aberdeen we spoke about? Remember, we're looking at specifically nailing in on our target product and our target market. How has serviced accommodation affected hotels in Margate? They're having a nightmare at the moment. 
Okay? How has helped to buy affected apartment stock in London? Yeah? Huge amounts of apartments on the market because developers got keen and they were motivated by this help to buy. Okay? How has non-Article 4 areas affected office supply? Everyone's converting offices in London into apartments and there's no bloody offices left for us to work in. Yeah? So let's have a look at the exit now. Always look at these multiple exits, okay? To keep yourself safe. Don't be naive to think that selling or renting and refinance are two separate exits. They're both, both based on the value of the property. Okay, so if you're basing an exit on the end value of your property, you need to be aware that if the end value drops, okay, that end value is going to drop from a valuation point of view as well when coming to rent and refinance. What else is different now? If I do a development and I can't sell it, I have to rent and refinance it, what's that rent and refinance based on? Or what's the refinance valuation based on? It's based on new rental stress tests. So a lot of developers going bust in London have done that with the express uh, goal to sell that development at the end. The market drops, they can't sell. They go, oh, it's okay, I'll refinance 75% and pay back my senior debt lender. But hold on, no, it's calculated on your rent. And actually, they can now only get 50, maybe 40% of their, of their debt to repay that senior debt lender. How do they plug that equity gap? So that's a big problem we're seeing. So uh, one of the greatest things I love in property is securitized income. How is that income underwritten? Um, uh, Rummy was talking about with care homes and the government underwriting them, doing large contracts, commercializing that residential uh, opportunity. Look at changes to exits and what that decision is based on, like I talked about with rental stress tests. Okay? Stress testing and sensitivity analysis when you do your numbers. What happens if time increases, development costs overrun, or end values go down? What is the market going to do? So what the market is doing right now, and what you feel it's going to do based on those factors, should help dictate the order of what your exits are. So for example, anything I'm looking at now, especially in the southeast, to develop, even if I really want to sell it, I've got to make sure, first and foremost, it works if I have to refinance and I can pay back that senior debt. Can I pay back my debt? That's the key. So when people say, oh, I'm in property for the long run, so it doesn't matter if there's a dip in the market, well, that's fine if you own it all cash. But if in that dip you need to refinance, how are you going to plug that equity? And can you cope with the standard variable rate you might go on to? One of the things... I'll have to look at is understanding the true net return on something. Okay, so people often say to me, well, why would you want a 5% yielding property in London when you can go up to Durham and get a 12% uh, yielding property? Well, I'll look at how long is that investment, do I, how long do I want that for? Okay, what's the value up there? As is my monthly rent going to be 300 quid versus three grand down here? How much effort am I going to be putting in? For example, HMOs. I've got a few HMOs, and what I've found is after about three years, they become a bit of a nightmare because no one wants, seems to want to live in a room on their own for the rest of their lives. They get girlfriends, and then they move out, and that creates maintenance, voids create turnover, maintenance. And then what happens is I've got to remarket it. There might be a snag on the wall that I've got to cover up. And I realise, oh, the room's looking a bit tired, and John down the road's just done an HMO, and it's got, I don't know, these mustard-coloured uh, cushions on grey walls, and it looks really lovely, and now I'm competing with that. So actually, that starts to kick into my net, all that maintenance cost. And when you look at it over a long term, that can really start to affect you. So again, we come back to that effort and the amount of time you've got to put in. Tax is massive, OK? Understanding what you get in your pocket after tax. So when you incorporate, you might be paying corporation tax and then income tax on that money. And everyone goes, no, 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 it's fine. It's tax-free. You, you get that back because it's as a director's loan. All well and good, unless, of course, you've got to show taxable income to remortgage your own home. So these things are things to consider. Look at what's your final exit. Are you going to 
sell up everything and go to the Bahamas for your last 10 years of life? Or are you looking to pass this on in a legacy? Because these things should help dictate how you structure at the beginning. And how capital outlay at the start can minimise losses over time. So don't put in the sh cheap, crappy shower unit that when someone who's over eight stone stands on it, it's going to crack. Spend a couple of hundred quid more and get the, big, uh, the, the better one because it's going to save you money in maintenance costs over time. I've got to try and whiz through these because I know we're done. Um, again, this slide was just about why I prefer to get that lower yielding property with a higher value because over time that causes me less effort, less stress, less maintenance, less voids, which are those silent killers. We've got an ever-changing landscape. What worked really well three years ago might, not lo might no longer work well. So understand what the market is. It's constantly changing, whether it's tax changes, interest rate rises, Brexit, availability of credit, oversupply of flats in Liverpool, whatever it is. So um, often now you get the curse of the training company. I did something really well in 2014. I bought a house, it burnt down, rebuilt it. I still made money because the market went like that. So I thought, yeah, it's easy. I'll teach everyone how. Don't get into that shiny penny syndrome, okay? And you have to be unemotional, which is much harder than it sounds uh, when making these investments. Understand the risk and what you can do to de-risk, okay? But also what that means. So for example, debt and equity, which one should you be taking? Sometimes if the market's going like that, if you take on more debt, it's going to magnify your returns. When the market starts to look a little bit shaky, you might want to exchange that debt for equity. And what you're really doing is giving away some of that risk in exchange for some of that reward. So it's just understanding where your product is on that market and where that market is as well. So I think I've been told I'm out of, out of time. But uh, hopefully we've got some questions at the end. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs>